Thanks for coming to our CEO Unplugged session. We are here today to talk about the MedTech ecosystem. And my name is Ipsita Smolinski. I'm from Capitol Street in Washington, DC. I'm going to moderate the panel. Before I introduce our speakers, our very esteemed panel here, I wanted to just put out three data points or trends that you might have even heard about as you've been in your sessions this morning um, to sort of frame the discussion. Uh, number one, we all know that uh, funding is down in the med tech space, down over 70% in the last seven to eight years, um, which has you know, required the more emerging companies to find creative sources of funding. Number two, consolidation. We're hearing about it all the time, big merger announced this week, but it's also happening in all of healthcare. Hospitals buying hospitals, teaming up with physicians, et cetera. Um, so I think that's a trend um, that largely started with the ACA in recent years, um, but one that we can continue to see. And then lastly, value-based payment. It used to be that the FDA was the bottleneck. Now reimbursement is the key question, um, doing more with less, ACOs, bundled payments, et cetera. So I wanted to just frame the discussion and let me go ahead and introduce our esteemed panel. Um, next to me is Mike Musalam, Chairman and CEO of Edwards. Next to Mike is Stuart Randall. He's Director of GI Dynamics and Teleflex. And on the end is Nadim Yared, President and CEO of CVRX. So we um, have the benefit of a larger company and then two more emerging company perspectives today on our panel. And I would read you their very impressive bios, but they're pretty much all in the, in the conference booklet, so I won't do that. Why don't we start off with Nadim, who is also, by the way, the chair of the AdvaMed Early Stage and Emerging Growth Company section. Why don't I just start out with a more general question of how do you describe the um, MedTech ecosystem today. Thank you, Ipsita. So when we talk about ecosystem, one thinks Everglades, but in a business sense, what we mean is that everything depends on everything else. And sometimes you make a change someplace and it has unintended consequences some other places. But often what it means is the interdependencies of all of the players in that space. So if we step back to 2008, there was one event, the economic crisis, that hit us very hard. Not only the, our industry, but all of the other industries. But unlike other industries where everybody else is on the recovery path, when you look at the small companies and the funding going to small companies, it has been an ongoing decline. And that, from my perspective, is one of the reasons why we are seeing a trend of consolidation on the mid to large size companies as well. Is the, this flattening of the growth, you need to increase the efficiency and therefore you need to consolidate a little bit more to get to increase your bottom line if you cannot increase your top line fast enough. So let's get back to the smaller companies. We say 70% reduction in the funds, right? Uh, but that means a much more stringent reduction in the funds going to the early stage startups, the innovators, those that have an idea, it's still a napkin, I need to go and raise my Series A to build my first prototype. Most often, venture capitalists, they reserve their money. So when they do an invest in a company, they keep two to three times that amount invested initially to be able to follow in subsequent rounds. So when the money is gone 70 or even 50%, what is remaining is now dedicated almost fully to fund the existing companies in the portfolio. And when you look at the number of companies being created right now in the United States, it is abysmally low, and the trend is not changing. It keeps going down. So what we're seeing here and why we have this cry of help is with that trend going down, we're going to have a dry up of a period of time of those startups, which would mean less technologies that Mike and other large companies can acquire in five or 10 years down the road, which would mean more consolidation, but you can consolidate until you have one large med tech company. What do you next? So uh, that, that, that's kind of what we're facing right now, and we've got solutions. So I'm, I'm painting a gloomy, doomy picture, but there are some bright spots, and what we need to do as an industry is all of us together leverage those bright stuff, spots, navigate to try to reverse that trend very quickly before it's too late. Well, speaking of the bright spots, Stu, I know you've traveled the world to secure funding. Can you provide your commentary? 
Sure, and I uh, appreciate Nadim's comments, and I think they're all right on. Um, and I think the, the answer is, is creativity on the financing side. So, you know, the, the early stage venture stuff is much more difficult today in the U.S., um, but there's more money available in Europe right now from the venture guys as well as certainly in Asia. And then I think on the mid-stage and the later stage, um, private equity was in, now they're not so much in today. Um, the mezzanine guys are all gone. But there's other capital markets that are available. Our company went public on the Australian exchange in 2011. Uh, we raised money, even though we listed on Australia, we raised money from investors in Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, London, as well as the U.S. And, um, you know, I think you got to be, think creatively about what markets are available, what access to capital is available, as opposed to what is not. So we raised a, a ton of money in an IPO and have done two subsequent financings, again, with institutional investors, uh, for the most part, outside the U.S. And I think that's a trend that will continue. Likewise, I think the uh, sovereign wealth funds, Tomasic in Singapore, Kaizana in Malaysia, you know, have extraordinary amounts of money. Um, they typically on the device side like later stage stuff, uh, but they'll, they'll take the biotech risk, not so much the medtech risk uh, early on. But uh, when you get to the point of revenue and some profitability, you know, these guys can write enormous checks and uh, are looking for places to put it right now. Why don't we switch gears a little bit and get the larger company perspective from Mike. Um, with the advent of the ACA, value-based payment, some of the trends I mentioned before, I'd love to hear your perspectives on um, the ecosystem and also how do we protect innovation? Yeah, yeah good questions. And, you know, I, I actually like to think of us as a small company. I know on a relative basis we're big, but maybe we're the smallest of the big companies. And I think there's something kind of charming about being small, isn't it? Because you can know your, know your patients and know your customers well and, and try and serve them. You know, there, there is a lot changing, that's for sure. And I'm sitting next to a couple of guys that are very successful in this emerging company uh, landscape. And for every person like them that's successful, there's, there's 10 that don't quite make it through that gauntlet. It's, uh, it's substantial to be able to get all the way through that. For larger companies, I think what they're facing largely is that the growth of healthcare in the U.S., Western Europe, and Japan is slowing down. And so that's saying, okay, how can we bring value to those systems? And everybody is looking at different ways of approaching that. Some of it says, okay, let's turn our attention to emerging markets because they're going to grow faster. Some of it in the core markets, then maybe we bring services, maybe we try and lower our cost basis by doing some of this combining of companies. I don't personally think it's the only way to add value. I still think that we can very much innovate for the U.S. and Western Europe and Japan. Do we think that healthcare is as good as it can get? No, it can be a heck of a lot better. The technology that's available out there can really drive incredible advancements for patients. And so it's possible, but the gauntlet is tougher than it's ever been before. It just takes longer. And what the system expects now is Bring me the hard evidence. You know, I'm, I know you've got a great relationship with my doctors, but that doesn't matter. Bring me the hard evidence that your innovations matter. So to be successful, to actually have something go from the napkin to patient and make a difference, and to be able to back that up with clinical data, quality of life data, back it up with data that says that it's cost effective, it just takes time and money. And so funding innovation is it's maybe as tough as it's ever been. I would agree with that, and I think the evidence is having to come earlier and earlier, too, which is always a challenge, almost like sort of pre-R&D, which is something that we were talking about in an earlier session. Um, what about consolidation? It's not just happening in med tech, it's happening with hospitals, with plans, with PBMs. Um, is there any other commentary on the, on the end about what that could mean? Any predictions? <laughs> Interesting question. Uh, so uh, what, what, what we've seen recently is two major acquisitions happening. I, I predict that's only the start, right? We will see more of this. I'm sure I'd, I'd love to hear what Mike would, would have to say about this as well. Uh, you know, we, we, it's, it, when you look back and you look at the car industry in the United States, we went through a very interesting wave of consolidation in the 60s and 70s. Very good, very profitable. It allowed us to extract profit from you know an industry that was not profitable until we hit some roadblocks. And that was, there was no growth then. We were stopped, there were no innovation, no small companies doing cars anymore in the United States. 
fast forward 40 years, we're still in that situation today with the exception of Tesla. So it took them 40 years to recover from that lull in terms of innovation. If you look at uh, closer to home, on the imaging side, on the medical imaging side, we've seen Philips, Philips GE and Siemens in the 90s going through that same wave, gobbling all of the uh, ultrasound companies, all of the x-ray companies. We end up with three large companies. There are no more or very few small companies right now to buy or to acquire or to innovate on, on the imaging side. So we don't want to have this happening on the implant and the med tech side and the diagnostic side. Now that said, on an individual level, that's a great thing that is happening for those companies who are consolidating. On an industry-wide level, I don't think that's so great. So that's the paradigm we're in right now. I, I, think, I think the, con the concern um, is that so, so the venture capital investors invest money <clears throat> so they can make money over a reasonable period of time. Um, and they can do that one of two ways. Typically in our industry, they either sell the company or they do an IPO. The IPO window for device companies has been pretty tough sledding in the U.S., uh, short of a company with you know 50 to 100 million dollars in revenue, so that leaves then leaves an M&A activity for the venture guys to get their return. Um, so to go back to Nadim's earlier comment on the ecosystem, the concern is that if Medtronic and Co when Medtronic and Covidian merged, they were both fairly prolific acquirers, and they were also fairly prolific investors in the early stage stuff. And um, having spent some time at a big company, you know I can envision the two of them merging, um, and it's. It's going to be a lot of, you know, how do we get the synergies faster um, from street expectations and other expectations that are put out there. So I think it'll be challenging for them to continue uh, both the pace of M&A as well as their pace of investing. And that's, a, that's a certainly a concern given the other dynamics we spoke about earlier for the earlier stage companies uh, at this time period. Let's, uh, I guess, shift gears and talk about the regulatory outlook. Um, Peggy Hamburg, the FDA commissioner, smoke spoke at lunch, and um, I guess I'm just curious, would you agree with what I said earlier that sort of the focus has gone from FDA being the bottleneck to the reimbursement conundrum, not just at CMS, but with private payers? Um, any commentary there? Uh, I might start. Um, you know, my sense is for <laughs> that the climate has dramatically improved with FDA. If we go back just a few years ago, it seemed that we were at loggerheads uh, on a pretty regular basis. Um, some things have changed. I think the negotiation of the user fees has helped. That was a generally a productive and objective process that we went through. I think also the FDA has become more sensitized with making sure that, that Americans actually get the benefit of some of the most innovative technologies. And they're a little bit smarting by the fact that some of these things would go to Europe years before they would get to the U.S. And so I think they've, they've really embraced the issue and they're, and they're working on changing. I, I see the vision that we hear from Commissioner Hamburg, from Jeff Shuren, is a very compelling vision. Now having said that, to get the machine to move from where they were to this new vision is going to be a journey. And it's going to be small and I'm sure, uh, you know, I, I hate to paint too rosy a picture because I'm sure there are people that are going through very difficult circumstances right now, but I feel like the climate definitely has moved. Payment is becoming a big issue. Yeah, no, I, I agree, Mike. I think the FDA um, is in a much better place, certainly more so mentally about where they want to go, uh, but we're starting to see much more of the smaller companies, a lot more tangible evidence of things improving pretty significantly. Um, we had a meeting with Dr. Maisel this morning, worked with Jeff Sharon. You know, they're, they're, they're working on some really innovative um, for well, the industry, thoughts about breakthrough technologies, how they can marry the regulatory as well as the payment piece together for really true, truly new to the world technologies. Um, they're working very hard to try to figure out how to get first in man studies back in the U.S. as opposed to in Europe where most of us uh, do those these days. Um, so I think FDA is certainly moving in the right direction. Uh, payment is tougher. You know, we, we launched our product in Europe um, a few years ago, but we, the strategy was set with the pre-2008 financial crisis and the reimbursement systems in Europe have certainly become much more stingy in the last few years than they used to be. So uh, regulatory is still fairly easy over there, but payment is certainly much more difficult in Europe. You know, one, one thing I'm going to add to this, and I totally agree with what Sue is saying, is uh, uh, what, what Commissioner Hamburg was talking about is the first to access, not the first to market, or some fine tuning on this. And, and, and that's very laudable. Uh, and, and here is one situation where 
uh, the uh, importance of some elements to larger company could be very different to, than smaller companies. So 80% or 75% of our members at Advermed are smaller to mid-sized companies. And when you think about in their point of view, they live from milestone to milestone. They raise money from milestone to milestone. Combining two milestones together and shifting them by one year, which are the reimbursement and FDA approval, on paper looks very well. Practically, for a privately funded company, that's a nightmare and maybe impossible to achieve. So I agree with what you were saying. I agree with what Dr. Mazel was saying. It's hard to turn that carrier, you know, the, the carrier, carrier, carrier in, in a whim. But at the same time, we have to be cognizant that there are some specificities in those fragile, small companies. And we need to take what they need into account. And that's why, actually, we created EGCC within Advermet to take this into account. That's a good point. And Dr. Shuren, by the way, is doing a town hall of CDRH is doing a town hall here, I think tomorrow morning, so something to watch out for. Um, I guess going back to reimbursement, um, what are you all witnessing as far as evidence? What types of evidence? Is it earlier and earlier? Are there any pieces of advice that you would give members of the audience from your experiences? Well, we had, a, we had an opportunity at Edwards Life Sciences to introduce something that was very novel, and C CMS decided that they were going to move early and they actually put a national coverage determination in, and they used a mechanism called coverage with evidence development. Now, we actually thought we had developed enough evidence at that point to maybe clear the threshold of necessary, reasonable and necessary, but, uh, but they pointed out that by using this coverage with evidence development tool, that they actually could create a flexible coverage model in which when new technologies are approved, they could actually be accommodated with this. And so uh, what they did is they, they shifted it to, let's make sure it gets done in centers of excellence that are qualified, but also let's collect data on every single patient that receives this technology and let's track this. And if it continues to go well, we'll continue to pay. And if it doesn't, we'll make some adjustments. So it's. Uh, if, you're, if you're on something that's really working, that's kind of a great policy. If it's not working, maybe it doesn't feel so good. But the idea of not having this very high hurdle that you have to clear for evidence before payment starts, I think, is, is enlightened. And if we can use coverage with evidence development just the right way, it could be powerful in terms of encouraging some innovation. So I'm, I'm a few years behind Mike's here, but, you know, and I, and I, and I, and a couple of years ago, a report from JP Morgan, they put number one, Edwards technology, the transcatheter valve, number two was my company's technology with CVRX. I just agree with that order, Mike, but that's for another day. Now, that said, <laughs> even though we're not yet approved in the United States, we started discussions with CMS in 2003. So imagine, 11 years ago. And as we started designing the first demand trial, the pivotal trials, all of the data collection, UB04, UB92s, et cetera, and every step along the way, we've been in conversation with, the, with CMS. It's, what are, what do you need? What are the information that you need? How, what's the type of patients that you want to, what's the percent of patients that have to be above 65 that you want to see in a trial? And more importantly, are these endpoints, the surrogates, acceptable to you, or do you want us to run a different set of trials? Because we need to know now, otherwise, you know, it changes the whole economic of this. Totally agree. You have to start as early as you can as you think about those issues with CMS. Dialogue, dialogue, so important. Agreed. Stu, do you have anything to add? No, these guys hit it right perfectly, of course. <laughs> of course. Um, what about parallel review, which is this idea that um, a company would pursue FDA approval sort of in tandem with CMS reimbursement? There's a couple of guinea pigs that are, that are uh, at it. Would you say that's more the exception than the rule, or? I think that's still playing out. Uh, we talked a little bit this morning about the exact sciences which did it. Um, and you know, from the small company standpoint, the, the potentially not so great news is when you have that conversation early, CMS may want a much larger trial with a lot more patients and more specific information. And um, so back to the financing discussion, that can make it uh, a pretty harrowing prospect. On the other hand, if you, can, if you can get that capital to do the study the right way, then I think it's great. But I don't think, I, I think it's for, um, my sense is it'll be for relatively few fewer products than, than many. Totally agree. Anyone else? No, totally agree. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Um, I guess, why don't we talk a little bit about, before we wrap up, what can Washington do? 
There's a 21st Century Cures initiative um, that members in the House are pursuing to really talk about innovative ideas to spur innovation, not just med tech, but biotech and uh, pharmaceuticals, et cetera. So are there any ideas brewing in the med tech space that um, we should be aware of? You know, what should Congress be doing to spur innovation? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start. I had a chance to, uh, and the honor to testify in front of that group. And uh, I think there are a number of things that can be done, and we certainly applaud the effort and, and hope that this is a moment where we actually could get some legislation that would move forward that would stimulate this industry of ours, which is a uniquely uh, American success story. Um, on, the, on the FDA side, this idea of, uh, particularly for, for w when it's not so clear, to lower some of these pre-approval barriers and to maybe have larger post-approval studies of the technology with the idea that um, in, instead of withholding the technology for Americans, and in some cases that it's really life-saving technology, that you would have a, a barrier that's a little bit lower, but you would collect uh, a substantial amount of evidence afterwards. And if the therapy is not living up to the way it's built, that you'd make adjustments and you wouldn't, you wouldn't leave it out there. I think that's sensible. How you implement that is challenging. The use of registries, for example, is very powerful. Uh, we, we get a chance to live a, a situation where there is a registry that collects data on all of the, our new procedure for transcatheter heart valve. It's a, it's a powerful tool, and it puts all that data in the public domain, and, and you have it for all the patients. The tough part about it is it's a, it's a big effort. There's 300 data fields, and it takes longer to fill out the registry than it does to do the procedure. So if we can sort of live up to the dream, which is, boy, could you populate the registry with electronic data right from electronic records and now get it down to the 30 important data fields, now you're into a much more sustainable scenario. 21st Century Cures, yeah, any? So, so we, we, with an advent, uh, we, uh, you know, innovation is at the core of what we're trying to achieve over the next couple of years. How do we fix that element of the ecosystem, particularly as it relates to smaller companies, right? That's the lifeline of smaller companies, innovation. We are establishing a framework for breakthrough technologies. It's multifactorial, multidimensional. It's still an early stage right now, so uh, see Google here maybe can talk about it more in depth, but there are multiple elements very exciting to me, and for once, we are leading the charge ahead of the curve. We're not waiting for politicians to change a tax code and we go out complaining that this is going to kill the industry. No, no, no. Here we will have a set of proposals going with them. Two politicians say, you do this, we'll save this jewel of industry called the medical device industry in the United States. You don't do this, we're in trouble. Right, so it's a multifactorial element that talks about devices that are truly breakthrough devices that can change the quality of life or save lives. Uh, and. Uh, I don't know how much I can expand on this, Steve. We'll probably leave it to another day, right? <laughs> well, hopefully there would be some mechanism to not only identify those breakthrough devices, but help in the reimbursement landscape, too, to sort of marry those two things. Yeah. So, so that, is, that is part of the proposal, is that, is that uh, for the truly breakthrough technologies, there would, in essence, be a, a uh, joint FDA-CMS decision up front very specific criteria, what, you, what qualifies as a breakthrough, and then um, if in fact you get designated breakthrough, and the trial is successful, in, in theory, and Steve's nodding his head, in theory, there would be an immediate coverage of that product for a period of time during which you would in essence have a registry to collect, collect you know, two to five year data. But you would in essence, upon FDA approval, uh, also have CMS approval. So things like that you know, are very, very exciting and potential uh, could be huge wins for the industry, certainly on the very early and the, and the real breakthrough technology. So uh, Steve and the staff at, at, at um, Avamed are working very diligently on that. I think we heard this morning there's meetings next week or the following week. Um, so that something like that could be a huge win for the industry. Yeah, one, a sense that uh, we have that the committee is focused on uh, not just trying to save money in the system, of which, of course, needs to happen and take out waste and improve efficiency. But I think they're also hearing from patients and that we want great quality, we want innovative care, can't we have both? And so the idea of trying to develop policies that allows us to have a learning system that somehow can accommodate 
innovations at the same time we're trying to drive efficiency and drive out waste is of critical importance. And you, you know with the power of consumerism that the voice of the patient is penetrating the DIN, and, uh, and, and it's, it's really encouraging to see that that message is getting through even when we had this uh, overriding concern that it costs too much, it costs too much. The patient is also saying, hey, how about us? Agreed. I mean, I, for one, am optimistic about 21st century's cures and hope they can do something sooner rather than later. Um, why don't we just but wrap you know, up and... Let me add one more word. Sure. The day an announcement is made is the day when money will start flowing from LPs to VCs, and it, it, it doesn't take a lot. We don't need to wait until products go through this to demonstrate it, because it's clear sign that the process is predictable, it is faster, uh, you know, it, it, we know exactly how much will it take and therefore it will unlock what is frozen today, right? So that, 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 that's the power of a change, a simple change like this that Congress can have. It's just one signature on a piece of paper and it unlocks a lot of things. I was just gonna have everyone sort of summarize, um, I guess, any concluding remarks and then I guess if there's any one or two pieces of advice you have for folks in the audience, why don't we start with you, Mike? Well, you know, I think one thing unique about this panel is we've got strong representation from small companies, and small companies continue to be the lifeblood of our industry, and so much innovation has come from these dedicated entrepreneurs who doggedly make it happen, and, and I don't expect that to stop. Although there's fewer, those that make it through that gauntlet are going to be powerful and profound and change the system and hopefully encourage others. I do think it's possible for companies our size to be innovators as well, and we work really hard at doing that, and we haven't given up on this idea that we can make healthcare better, that we, the medical technology industry, can bring a lot of tools that just don't exist today. And so we haven't lost our confidence. We haven't lost our drive. I, I think it's no time to get on defense. It's time to be on offense. I think on the investing side, you know, all investments go in uh, peaks and troughs, and we're in a bad spot right now. I do think it's getting better on the investment side. I think it will continue. People will look at more, more places and find capital. Um, FDA is getting better. Some of the 21st century stuff is, uh, is looking fantastic. And the advice I always give to the entrepreneurs is raise a ton more money than you think you need and raise it earlier than you need it. <laughs> And you know, for a plane to take off, it's much easier to take it against the wind than with the wind. So if you're an entrepreneur, if you've got an idea, start now, because in a couple of years, when those changes will happen, you want to be ready to go and start raising your larger fund and do your pivotal trials. Don't wait until it's fixed. You'll be competing with thousands of other entrepreneurs. Do it now when the opportunity is here. All right, thank you very much, and thanks for joining us. Thank you.